Welcome to Cohen in the City, Suburban On Air, and it really is an honor to have uh, an old friend, someone I knew when he was just your average guy. You know what? He still is that average guy, except immensely successful, and the fact he's made time for us today. Mitch Garber, welcome. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Mitch, there's so many things we can talk about. Of course, you and I go way back, uh, friends with the, my brother, friends with me, um, you know, in the press box when you were uh, a law student, you know, growing up as just your average kid who needed tuition assistance to, to go into high school. And now here you are, a, a very, very successful businessman, entrepreneur, and philanthropist. Um, do, you, do you ever pinch yourself to say, look, this is where I am today, and this is where I was many years ago? Yeah, I, I do that a lot. By the way, I was also a good friend of your dad's. Um, That's spent right. A lot of, spent a lot of time with him and, and appreciated him a lot. Yeah, of course, I pinch myself all the time. And I think, uh, I think COVID has given me um, an added opportunity to, to, to pinch myself. And I think a lot of people should be pinching themselves, people who um, still have a roof over their heads, people who are still employed, people are, are still getting, uh, getting paid, whose businesses uh, somehow can survive uh, this extended period of, of, of you know, economic, I guess, economic downturn. So I've been pinching myself, yes, but I think today um, it's a little bit more of a, of a humble pinch because uh, everyone's out there to help each other. And if you have any good fortune at all, I think you should be spending some of your time, if not a lot of your time, just trying to help people because um, sometimes, sometimes it's not in your inner circle that you see how much people are suffering. But the reality is, and I see it in the, in the CJA campaign by going out and, and seeing what's happening with the elderly and how people um, are losing their small businesses or can't make their payments to the bank or can't make their mortgage payments or their kids' tuition payments. So I know, I know the question was, was well intended about, you know, my good fortune, but at the end of the day, living in, in the COVID period, it's the time to talk about, I think for me, the people who, uh, who need help. Now you're staying safe with your family, but you were in Italy. You, you are now self-isolating, so you're following the rules. Uh, what's that like, you know, going, uh, like, what's it like being in Italy actually, because they were COVID central at a certain point. Yeah, and, and they got it under control. And I think um, Canada learned a lot from Italy. Um, we became maybe a little overprotective in Canada, not letting anybody from the outside uh, come into, into our country. I still think there are safe places and, and there are people that can be tested. And, um, you know, Air Canada, which generates $10 billion of economic activity for the country, is right now generating almost zero. Um, but uh, I think, um, you know, I think the country's handled it, obviously, from a case perspective very well. Uh, I think our premier, um, you know, notwithstanding the terrible outcome at the elderly uh, care homes, I think our premier has done a very good job um, at keeping us safe as long as people follow the rules and wear masks. And so you asked me, how's Italy? And to be honest, um, the people there are really following the rules. So, you know, every week they'll change a rule in a different city. If there's a spike, you have to wear a mask outdoors all the time. If there's no spike, you have to wear a mask outdoors during the weekend. Uh, and all the time inside a store, in a taxi, or in a bus, or, or, or in an airport, or an airplane. And so, um, you know, they're very similar, I think, right now to, to the way we're living. Our, I, I'm living my life right now the way I was in, in, in Italy, although I'm not going out because I have to spend 14 days in, um, in quarantine at home. And uh, now you were pre-COVID named the uh, chair of the Combined Jewish Appeal campaign for 2020. Obviously, when COVID hit, things changed and it became a kind of a resilience campaign. And uh, you're now a, a co-chair with Jonathan Weiner for a two-year campaign. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, I, I was very honored to be the chairman of the, um, of the CJA campaign, where we would go out and raise around $30 million, which is the, the budget that the CJA uh, organizations require on an annual basis. And then COVID hit and it became obvious that we needed a lot more money and we needed some of the money urgently. Uh, it started, if you'll remember, it started with the urgent elderly care, the elderly who were unable to leave the home. And it wasn't yet established how you'd get your groceries and how you'd get your, your, your prescription drugs. Um, and over time, I think we've learned how to help each other. But the reality is that you still have this, you know, enormous number of people unemployed you still have people in small businesses like restaurants and, and retail stores. And in the Jewish community, we have a lot of restaurants and retail stores um, who are either not open or have very, very low traffic. So we realized we needed to help our community in a meaningful way. And I asked John Wiener and, 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 and CJA asked John if he would join me this year and that we would undertake a two-year campaign. And instead of raising 60 million over two years, 30 million a year, we'd raise a hundred million dollars, 60 million for CJA's infrastructure needs, all the agencies they, they support, and $40 million for uh, this recovery 
uh, program, which is, is very, very meaningful. And it touches many, many areas and many people in the community. We have almost 28% of the Jewish community is on or under the poverty line. So most of the Jewish people that you and I know wouldn't think that because um, we, we generally travel in circles where people are not below the poverty line. But we have to become conscious of the fact that we're part of a community that does have um, a high level of poverty. Even yeah. No, we don't necessarily see it every day. Yeah, you froze there a little bit, but I think we got the, the, the gist of what you were saying. Um, now, that's a great thing you're doing. Uh, you're involved in a lot of things. A lot of, of things have been affected by the economy, by COVID. And of course, you're the chair of Cirque du Soleil, and they've been in the news as well, and there have been some problems. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's a huge tragedy. Um, you know, I feel terribly about it. Um, I don't know any other business other than the Cirque du Soleil that is at zero revenue. We went from 1.1 billion to zero, 6,000 employees to maybe I think today 100 or 200. Um, and I don't see any revenue coming back in the next many, many months. And so when you have a $400 million Canadian payroll, that's the payroll of Cirque du Soleil, 6,000 employees, um, and you have zero revenue, you have no choice but to essentially shut down the business. And ultimately, we had to restructure the debt of the business. And um, ownership of the Cirque du Soleil in the next weeks is going to change. And, and the lenders of, of the money that you know, was lent to the Cirque du Soleil um, will end up owning, owning the Cirque. It's, it's really quite, it's very, very, very sad. It's sad for the employees. It's sad for the performers. Um, but to see a business go from $1.1 billion to zero and have a $400 million payroll, it's just unheard of. Um, so I, I, you know, I just don't know what to say other than, you know, my heart goes out to the people who, who have lost their, their jobs. I hope it's temporary. I hope there will be at some point in the near future, although I don't think it'll be the near future, um, large scale live entertainment where people in the thousands can go and, and see a live event indoors. And Cirque du Soleil had 44 shows traveling around the world or permanently based in Las Vegas and now zero. So it's a very sad sad situation for uh, for Cirque and some of the cruise line companies also went to zero and are selling off cruise ships it's just quite it's, it's it's quite sad very very sad Mitch you've accomplished so much in your time in business uh, you know and 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 brought yourself into your present economic uh, stature because you've got a good eye for uh, the dollar and how to what to do with it so what would you recommend to let's say Canadian and Quebec governments to start with how are we ever going to relaunch our economies and get back to normal? I mean, I know we're waiting for a vaccine, but what do you see coming in the next six months to a year? I, you know, it's very difficult because, um, you know, one of the only ways to do this is, is to lend money and give money. The government uh, has, has to provide stimulus into the economy. It's going to increase the indebtedness of our children and our grandchildren. And that, that's going to happen. Um, but COVID is a situation where I do think that that's justified. At the same time, you know, we used to say by Canadian or we used to say by Quebec, the Panier Bleu, as a sort of um, as a kindness. I really believe it's a necessity right now. I really think that those that can should be buying and buying local and really supporting the businesses. If we can't go to a restaurant, but you can afford to do takeout, do takeout from a good local restaurant. Uh, you know, I don't mean to... Um, you know, I don't want to hurt the business of McDonald's, but McDonald's doesn't need my help as much as a local entrepreneur who's had a family restaurant for the last 30 years, like the Snowden Delicatessen, as an example. Um, you know, I think we have to go out and, and, and support them um, or, or Beach A on, on Sherbrooke Street. Or, I mean, there's so many of them that, that our friends own these restaurants and, um, and we need to take care of them. Uh, retail stores. Yeah, we're buying a lot on Amazon, but you know what? You can go to a retail store today and you can actually buy merchandise locally and bring it home. And as tempting as it is, and I do it too, okay, I'm guilty of it as well. Amazon is so easy, but our friends are suffering because there is no traffic in their stores and they're stuck with the inventory. So maybe we have to sacrifice a little bit um, and get out, get in the car, go to the store and buy local. So the government has to help, but at the same time, I think we have to do our own job at supporting our, our local brothers and sisters in business. Mitch, you, you, you're a you know, born and bred Montrealer, Hampsteader, Westmounter, Downtowner, uh, you know, when uh, when you had the big job, uh, uh, you know, with the uh, casinos, uh, Caesars, uh, you insisted on your office staying in downtown Montreal. Downtown Montreal is pretty dreadful right now. 
Uh, I was down there Saturday night, uh, went to a Shodan for sushi to pick up sushi. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's a pretty great place. And uh, the owner is, is uh, Romeo is pretty heroic and he uh, has decided to, to roll the dice. And on Wednesdays and Thursdays, he's opening for lunch in a downtown that's dying. Uh, you know, there's a place that was always packed at lunch, always packed at dinner. Uh, uh, Plant, Mayor Plant is trying to revive a, a downtown area that I think she's kind of dug into a hole. Uh, there's nowhere to park. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on downtown Montreal and whether that could be revived? No, I think it will be revived. We are going to go back to our offices. We are going to go back to shopping downtown. You mentioned the vaccine earlier. Um, I don't think we need the vaccine in order to get back to somewhat normal. We need to wear masks. We need to wash our hands. Um, your father was a big proponent of washing your hands. Let's see, ever. Many, many, many years before COVID. Um, so uh, I could tell that story too. But um, <laughs> no, we do need to wear masks and wash our hands and keep distance. And we can do those things at Shodan. And we could do those things, um, you know, at, at Garage or, or at any of the, the lo- or at Aldo or any of the local stores. So um, I think downtown will come back. I'm looking forward to getting back into the office. I want to get out of my house and I want to go downtown. Um, I think it might be longer before we sit at a Habs game, you know, 19,000 of us next to each other. Yeah. That's the problem of the Cirque du Soleil, except that the Cirque du Soleil doesn't have a TV contract. So that's the, the, the biggest difference. Yes, yes. And speaking of hockey, uh, one of the other things you're doing uh, is you're a part of the ownership group of the new Seattle Kraken NHL team, which is supposed to start in 2021, 2022. And that's pretty exciting, even though in the COVID era they're getting started. Tell me a little bit about what, how that's uh, going. Going great. Actually, I'm wearing this sweatshirt right now, so release the crack and it's right. Oh, here. I didn't notice that. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So no, it's going. It's going great. Uh, the partners of this team are incredible. We've got a really great group of partners, uh, starting with David Bonderman and film producer Jerry Bruckheimer, and then uh, you know Todd Lewicki, our general manager Ron Francis. Then we've got a bunch of really great owners that are from Seattle, that are business leaders in in, in the Seattle area, um, and a couple of Canadians actually as well. So. The team is really hiring a, a tremendous front office, uh, starting with Ron Francis and Todd Laiwecki, um, and then looking forward to the draft next June, if it takes place next June, because now the current yes. draft is taking place in October. But yes. if the draft takes place next June, and it could be in Montreal, and it could be in Seattle, and it could be on the internet, so who knows, um, we'll be drafting in that, in that, uh, in that draft. and we will be drafting in much the same, exactly the same fashion uh, as the Las Vegas uh, Knights did uh, a few years ago except that the Knights aren't part of the draft. So they don't, they don't have to make players available. That was part of their deal um, yeah. when they came into the league. My last question is uh, another venture you're involved. We could talk all day, but I'm going to limit it, this interview to this is that the ex bringing the Expos back has COVID had any impact. Is it making it more likely or less likely we'll get the Expos back? I know you're part of that, that old potential ownership group as well. Yeah. So Steven Bronfman is really running that process. And um, you know, a lot of it has to do with Tampa Um, where is baseball going to land when this is all said and done? Where's Tampa going to land? It's a difficult time to talk about, you know, baseball teams and stadiums, uh, et cetera. But I would definitely not think that COVID has in any way uh, hurt the chances of, uh, you know, this, this group led by Steven bringing baseball back to Montreal. There's no reason to think that, uh, that we're any less likely to be successful. We have the support of major league baseball. Um, We definitely have, and, and, you know, I'm not really involved day to day, but, you know, William Yeager and Steven have a really good, and Pierre Boivin, a very good relationship with the, uh, the Tampa Bay Rays and their ownership and, and management team. So we'll see how things pan out in Tampa. Really, they have to deal with their own situation in Tampa. And then we need to figure out whether, you know, we can, uh, we can share a team or, or, or buy the team or, or whatever the, the outcome is. Well, Mitch, great talking to you. And uh, we certainly wish you luck right now with the CJA campaign. And Thank you. We'll- put some information in the description about that. So all the best and stay safe. You too. And thanks, Mike. All right. Great talking to Mitch Garber.